My name is Katherine Matthews, and I'm the Director of Education at Old North Illuminated. Welcome to tonight's speaker series event, and as always, thank you very much for your support of our programming. At Old North, we work to share the stories of all the people and communities that are part of our site's physical, spiritual, and social history. In recognition of that, we acknowledge that Old North Church sits on land that was once the land of the Massachusetts people. By the time Old North was built in 1723, the Massachusetts people had been driven and displaced from their homes and decimated by disease and warfare. Their story and suffering has been obscured in the historical record, yet they survive and the memories of their ancestors live on in the Massachusetts community. May we reflect on the lessons of history and learn from them. This year, we celebrate the 300th anniversary of the founding of Christ Church in the city of Boston, also known as Old North. We will be marking this milestone with events and special programming throughout the year, focusing on shedding light on lesser known stories and exploring aspects of the religious identity of Old North and its people through the centuries. Next month, on March 23rd, Drs. Richard Bowles and Margaret Newell will discuss the oft overlooked stories of black and indigenous peoples in, in New England's religious history. This discussion will be moderated by Old North Research Fellow, Dr. Jamie Crumley. And on May 10th, Wellesley Professor Stephen Marini will talk about music and worship in the colonial era. You'll be able to find information about that on Eventbrite. Two other things. If you're in the Boston area, we are open for tourism this week and we open for the season on March 1st. The second thing is please mark your calendars. Lanterns and Luminaries, which is our annual fundraising event and celebration of active citizenship will take place on April 20th at the church. This year's honoree and keynote speaker is historian and Pulitzer Prize winning author, Annette Gordon-Reed. Tickets and sponsorship information are available on our website. But tonight, tonight we have Dr. Chernos Assay, who will speak to us about Black Spaces in White Worlds, Prince Hall, Freemasonry and Emancipation. The late 18th and early 19th centuries were years of revolution and reinvention as people worked to redefine themselves in a changing landscape. People of African descent played a vital role in this process, carving out new spaces and new opportunities for themselves and their communities. Dr. Sasse is an associate professor of religious studies at DePaul University in Chicago. An award-winning teacher, Dr. Sasse's writing has appeared in the New England Quarterly and the Journal of African American Studies, among many, many other publications. He is currently working on a book entitled Black Boston and the Making of African American Freemasonry, Leadership, Religion, and Community in Early America. He is also a member of the Old North Illuminated Education Committee. We are truly honored to have him speak tonight. So with that, I'll remind you to mute your microphones, put your questions and comments in the chat, and above all, to enjoy tonight's talk. Cherno, it's yours. Thank you so much, uh, Catherine, uh, for that wonderful introduction. And I also want to thank uh, Nikki Stewart and uh, Jason Fishman and Emily Spence and, and all of the staff at Old North uh, Illuminated uh, for hosting me and allowing me the opportunity to share some of my work and my writing with you. And last, uh, but certainly not least, uh, all of you in the audience, thank you for showing up, taking time out of your days, the end of uh, what is, I'm sure for many of you, busy days. Um, so I really appreciate that. Thank you. So I'm going to, let's see here, share my screen with everybody. Hopefully this goes without a hitch. All right, um, Catherine, I can see you. Does that, is it still working? Oh, excellent, all right. 
So Black Spaces in White Worlds, Prince Hall Freemasonry and Emancipation. The, I won't be talking about all of the items that you see on the screen, but I have them here because in some ways they give a very broad overview of Prince Hall Freemasonry and uh, its early beginnings. So I will identify some of these objects as a segue into the talk. Before I do that, I just wanna say briefly some of the things that are at stake. And so uh, there, there are kind of three big issues that, that I think we should keep in mind as I'm kind of going through this, this work. Uh, and, and they would be the issue of historical interpretation, race and politics, and then public education. So why historical interpretation? Well, this is really an exciting time for thinking about the American Revolution. Uh, we're coming up on the 250th. Uh, there's a lot of programming that's leading up to that. And uh, there's a lot of scholarship that's being produced you know, for academic audiences, but also for public audiences that, that is really amazing. And we also have these larger debates uh, in which the revolution is interpreted in various ways. So, you know, to kind of give you a brief summary of these polls, you know, for some, the revolution is a watershed event. It's something to be celebrated and, and it marks a kind of continuum in the progression of history. For others, for others who think about history uh, cyclically or who are perhaps a bit cynical about the idea of, of progress, the American Revolution presents itself as a moment of paradox, a moment of contradiction, where we do have uh, progress in some respects, where we do have the expansion of democracy, but that we also have at the very same time increased marginalization uh, and the, 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 the continuation of various forms of racism and, and misogyny. So those are kind of the two poles, right? That, that in various interpretations of the American Revolution are operating between. I think for in full transparency, my talk in some ways is arguing for a kind of middle ground between those two stark positions. So that's, that's historical interpretation. Uh, the second kind of big theme or big issue here has to do with race and politics. So quite simply, the American Revolution was not something that just happened to Black people or Indigenous people or to women or to children uh, or to the poor. Uh, the American Revolution, and a lot of new work is really bringing this to light, the American Revolution consisted of people's everyday experiences. And so people lived in the moment. You know, if you start in the 1760s, it wasn't clear that, you know, the colonies were going to break from Great Britain. But at the same time, you do get changes in politics. And everyday people were making really important contributions in their own ways to the developing politics of the revolutionary era. And so one of those groups, people of African descent, were making their own kinds of moves. And so again, the revolution didn't just happen to them. They were in fact part of revolutionary era politics. So historical interpretation, race and politics, and then, and then public, uh, public education. And here I just want to really applaud the work of Old North uh, illuminated. Uh, and so, for example, the work of Dr. Jamie, Jamie Crumley and, you know, all of the public uh, activities that the, the Old North is doing, uh, things that are being organized by Catherine to, to get people into the church and to really think deeply and, and even personally about their own connections to the past is, is really important. And and it's particularly important in this moment where in various places uh, throughout the US, you know, uh, public education, it really is uh, under fire. And so it's really important for us to be able to talk about uh, histories that deal with not only kind of pressing issues, but that also uncover uh, 
unexpected things in the past and that help us to understand how power has worked in American democracy. And so moving to the crux of my talk, people of African descent used traditions like Freemasonry to carve out religious and political space in the colonial period and during the American Revolution. In doing so, they practiced politics and fashioned community in unexpected places while playing pivotal roles in historic change. Not only do the origins of Black Freemasonry reveal the complex fashioning of African-American leadership, identity, and community, its beginnings also reflect the problems and possibility of democracy in America and in the North Atlantic world during what historians have called the Age of Revolutions. Given the wider historical significance of Freemasonry, academic historians have given it surprisingly little examination, however. My work seeks to address that underemphasis and today represents a brief introduction to the early development of Freemasonry among people of African descent during the American Revolutionary Era. And so before I talk specifically about Black Freemasonry, I think it's useful to talk about context. And here the context would be that of emancipation, and in particular gradual emancipation in Massachusetts. And so beginning in the mid-18th century, English colonists began to question the institution of slavery in new ways. They began to see human bondage as something that was not an acceptable form of property. And instead, they began to view slavery as something that was contrary to being human. So abolition in Massachusetts very slowly recognized that the property rights of enslavers should not take primacy over the humanity of the enslaved. For example, the recent work of historian Gloria Whiting demonstrates that manumissions were increasing in Suffolk County by the 1760s. And this is important because it locates the origins and development of emancipation in households before it took root in the legislature, the courts, or the law. However, when we look closely at manumissions, we also see paternal, paternalism at work, and in fact, racialized paternalism. Former enslavers sometimes worried about whether the newly freed could care for themselves. And we see this in probate records where many former enslavers in fact released their own humans only under particular circumstances. So freedom did not come without constraint and qualification. And when we look to judicial, legal and legislative sources of emancipation, we find hesitancy. A noted letter from Abigail Adams to her husband, John Adams, and ah, here we go, uh, provides an ex a specific example of some of the tensions uh, that were involved in the ending of slavery and its ramifications for Black politics. And so writing in September 1774, uh, Abigail expressed her fear of a, quote, conspiracy of the Negroes, quote. She worried, and, and I'll read, there has been in town a conspiracy of the Negroes. At present, it is kept pretty private and was discovered by one who endeavored to dissuade them from it. He being threatened with his life applied to Justice Quincy for protection. They conducted in this way, got an Irishman to draw up a petition to the governor telling him they would fight for him provided he would arm them and engage to liberate them if he conquered. And then just a few lines later, she continued, I most sincerely, I, mo I wish most sincerely, there was not a slave in the province. It always appeared a most iniquitous, iniquitous scheme to me. Fight ourselves for what we are daily robbing and plundering from those who have as good a right to freedom as we have. This Justice Quincy was Edmund Quincy, older brother of the prominent uh, patriot, Colonel uh, Josiah Quincy. And uh, the governor at this time was Thomas Gage, who had only recently replaced Thomas Hutchinson. And so this letter has led scholars to ask whether Black Bostonians were actually planning some kind of uprising or whether Adam's fears reflected an unsubstantiated anxiousness about changing racial relationships in the city. We should take Abigail's worry seriously less as evidence of Black rebellion, that might have been the case, but, but more because it expresses how she and others framed Black politics. So unequivocal in her anti-slavery belief, but anxious about the choices of the enslaved, 
Adam's worry reflected the fact that people of African descent were making their own political choices. That free and enslaved Black people were choosing their allies moved Adams to describe a possible Black alliance with imperial forces as a, quote, conspiracy. By the time of her letter, colonial tensions in Boston had certainly increased to the point that people were choosing and being forced to choose whether they would identify with British rule or developing American patriotism. Her letter illustrates that a white person could critique slavery while also fearing that Black people would make salient political decisions that reflected their own interests over those of even white sympathizers. Adams' cautionary anti-slavery perspective helps us understand a central tension within gradual emancipation. Abolition raised new questions about citizenship rather than answer them. What would equality, settlement, and citizenship mean, especially for the newly free? Abigail's anxiety helps us understand the profound social and political proscriptions that framed Black politics. However, her reaction also illustrates that revolutionary era politics was shaped in part by Black people and was not simply something that happened to them. We should not reduce racial politics in Boston to Adam's fears, yet her perspective reflected a fundamental tension in the developing relationship between race and politics as the colony moved further from British control. And so Black Freemasonry arose amidst this complexity and seeming contradiction. As colonial hostilities escalated into explicit rebellion during the 1770s, at least 15 men of African descent became Freemasons. They were initiated not by an existing American lodge, but probably by a white military soldier. After gaining initiation, instead of joining a white lodge, these Black men immediately set about forming their own lodge. They called it African Lodge Number One. Did they do this because white lodges were not open to them after their entrance or because prior to their admission, they had already decided to form their own lodge? There's not a clear answer. However, this clearly was a crucial event. If Hall and his cohort had become members of, white, of a white lodge or white lodges, this would have undoubtedly led to a different history of Freemasonry and race during the eras of the revolution and the early Republic. But either way, in the context of imagination, emancipation, Black Freemasons embodied various tensions between democracy and deference and between freedom and slavery. Their presence intensified a complex reckoning, making it all the more difficult to ignore questions about racial equality. The development of African Lodge Number no. One, the first Black corporate institution in North America, coincided with the first and unprecedented Black-led formal anti-slavery campaign in the Northern colonies turned states. In the 1770s, people of African descent in Massachusetts, relying upon broad interracial political and social networks, led a public abolitionist campaign that had far-reaching significance during its time and beyond. London experienced no such activity amongst its Afro-British population until the late 1780s, and the Massachusetts level of organization and articulation of concerns predated similar efforts in Connecticut and Hampshire, New York, and Pennsylvania by almost a decade. Although scholars have treated uh, these, uh, these, the petitions of this campaign separately from the abolitionist writing of the famous Black, Black poet Phyllis Wheatley, it is not beyond possibility that she knew of these addresses to the legislature. And so the timing of these Black led addresses and instructions coincided with the mid to late century rise of manumissions in Suffolk County and with growing numbers of towns declaring their anti slavery sentiment to the general court, the Massachusetts general court. This Black cohort engaged whites through networks of communication like those formed by the committees of correspondence. Now, committees of correspondence were representative groups from various Massachusetts towns that were created after 1770 and meant to foster communication and solidarity regarding colonial unease with the British government. And so here I have an excerpt from that 1773 
uh, petition that was sent to the Massachusetts General Court and that was also published uh, as a pamphlet in other literature that was distributed throughout the colony. And what's interesting about this, uh, to, about this quote, to put it in a bit of uh, uh, context, is that the tone of this petition, while certainly abolitionist, was very much kind of deferential and conciliatory. So it assumed that the Massachusetts government um, should play a direct role in ending enslavement. In, in, in other words, that emancipation shouldn't end just by people freeing their enslaved persons or manumitting their enslaved persons, but in fact, there needed to be some kind of government uh, force uh, that helped this process along. And so here you have uh, a little excerpt from the records, uh, uh, the annals as it were, of the, the, how, the legislative proceedings. And so it's important to remember that the legislature would receive hundreds of petitions, okay? And so this was a very normal way of having your concern met. Uh, and all sorts of groups would petition. Uh, groups would petition, individuals uh, would petition, and uh, petitions could concern any number of kinds of issues that people thought uh, were, were important. And so you can in fact see in, uh, in legislative records uh, that not only is this petition from Felix taken up, but in fact, as we move forward in time, uh, the legislature is constantly making reference to these petitions as it's considering things like various uh, anti-slavery or anti-slave trade acts. A brief outline of this campaign clarifies and highlights its breadth and structure. This would be the, the, of the black petitioners. So in January, 1773, a black author named Felix, and here you see Felix Holbrook in the document I have on the screen. Felix sent to the Massachusetts legislature a formal petition this critique also appeared as part of a widely distributed pamphlet that included other anti-slavery missives and was published by Ezekiel Russell, a printer of other abolitionist material. Like Felix in the first appeal, the four black authors of a second petition dated April 20th, 1773, called themselves, calling themselves, quote, a committee and declared their writing, quote, in behalf of our fellow slaves in this province. These authors effectively formed a black committee of correspondence. In addition to Felix now giving his last name as Holbrook, Peter Bess or Besties, Sambo Freeman and Chester Droy signed this second appeal and somehow had it distributed to at least two different places, Thompson and Taunton. This address took the form of a circular, essentially a petition sent to towns or groups for their consideration and support. Of these writers, Peter Bess or Besties would become a founding member of African Lodge Number no. One. In June 1773, Black authors sent another address, the second formal petition to the Massachusetts Governor and General Assembly. This was also printed in the Massachusetts Spy in the Essex Gazette. And it turns out that the printer of the Massachusetts Spy, Tom, Isaiah Thomas, uh, was also a Freemason who also published uh, abolitionist literature through uh, the 1770s. In January of 1774, the black abolitionists sent yet another petition to the general court. This was not an entirely new message, but instead it was an urgent reminder that the court should continue its deliberations in response to the petition from June 1773. In March 1774, the Boston Gazette published an anti-slavery critique from the famous Phyllis Wheatley, and in May, the general court received a third petition from black critics. In June, the legislature received a fourth petition. And then in September of the same year, 1774, the Massachusetts spy printed the January reminder. Each of these four formal petitions was noted in the legislative records of the Massachusetts General Assembly, 
And this is a crucial point. Although the Massachusetts government did not pass any measure in direct response to these petitions, each of these addresses not only added to anti-slavery sentiment, they encouraged and amplified it. Government debates about the slave trade and slavery did not result in any immediate and singularly successful legislative abolitionist law, yet the petitions presented sustained, represented sustained effort. They forced deliberation and they intensified the ways in which actual bondage and not just metaphorical enslavement in fact became powerful, became a powerful rhetorical rep weapon for both the British and uh, the Patriots. And so here is uh, uh, a depiction of Phyllis Wheatley from her frontispiece. And I have with her in some ways, her nemesis, uh, Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, who in fact questioned her intelligence. And so uh, kind of two things about Wheatley that uh, those African-American men who petitioned and became Freemasons are themselves part of a broader abolitionist movement in print that Wheatley really was at the forefront of. So even though I'm spending a lot of time talking about men, it's important to remember that the voices of women, and in particular, African-American women, um, are part of this process of emancipation. The second thing that I want to say about uh, Wheatley via Jefferson and then linking it back to Freemasons is that as I'll talk a little bit more about, Freemasonry was all about uh, the relationship or the, 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 the attainment of a particular kind of what people thought was sacred knowledge. And so when I talk about Freemasons embodying equality, they, like Wheatley, be, become living examples of the intellectual equality of Black people to white people. And when we think about the contradictions of the revolution and race, we have to think about somebody like Jefferson and how after the revolution, um, scientific racism uh, increases, it expands, uh, and it becomes a new argument against the kind of equality embodied by Wheatley and uh, the Black Masonic petitioners. Given the outbreak of war, Massachusetts legislative records make no mention of a Black abolitionist petition written in 1777. However, this missive was signed by eight men, four of whom were or would become members of the African Lodge. Prince Hall, the eponymous earliest leader of the African Lodge, helped draft this 1777 petition and was probably manumitted in 1770. Peter Best, who I've briefly already mentioned, was an original member of African Lodge, and he also helped draft the April 1773 circular, as well as this address from 1777. Brister Slenzer, also a first initiate, signed this uh, 1777 appeal, and so did Lancaster Hill. Uh, Hill became uh, a member of the African Lodge sometime after 1775, and by 1779, Lancaster Hill had attained the degree of Master Mason and had become treasurer of the African Lodge. The four other composers of this 1777 address, uh, Pierpont and either Funello or Sunello, Sumner and Locke vanish from Boston public records. And so the language of the petitions moved from uh, kind of a deferential critique to direct demand. The 1777 petition expressed the impatience of earlier petitions and became more explicit in its demand for slavery's end. Addressing the general court, these writers noted sarcastically, quote, your honor need not be informed that a life of slavery like that of your petitioners, quote, who were, quote, deprived of every social privilege of everything requisite to render life tolerable, end quote, represented a circumstance, quote, far worse than non-existence. This sarcasm mark differed markedly from the deferential tone of previous appeals. For these Black abolitionists, the timing between their activism and their emergent masonry was not coincidental. 
Their initiation and in abolitionism singled, signaled their coming of age and represented watershed moments for people of African descent in and around Boston. The Freemasonry of Black people, while mirroring that of their white counterparts, also was forged by race. It was an embodied strategy of action and thought meant to clear space for the leadership, influence, and history of African descended people at an historical moment of rupture and continuity and of emancipation and prescription. So the relationship between Black Freemasons and the petition campaign is significant for four major reasons. First, historians have simply not recognized the direct links between organized interracial abolitionism and the emergence of Freemasonry among Black people. Second, although scholars look to the 1790s to find the beginnings of organized Black abolition, the work of these Black Masons shows that New England's Black anti-slavery leadership crystallized 20 years earlier. Third, gradual emancipation was not something bestowed upon the enslaved. Their demands for abolition actually shaped debate and drove it forward. Finally, although the ending of slavery did not bring definitive citizenship to the formerly enslaved, they always remained pivotal political actors during the revolution and in the developing politics of the new nation. So with that context, I think we can move to talk more specifically about Freemasonry relative to Black Bostonians. And so what I have on the screen are the constitutions of the Freemasons containing the history charges regulations of that most ancient and right worshipful fraternity. And so this was a booklet uh, that included not only the uh, kind of a mythical history of Freemasonry, it also included uh, guidance on the, the rites and rituals that were part of uh, initiation. And so just what was and what is Freemasonry? Well, Freemasonry is a living tradition. It is a fraternal association and uh, although depending upon place, it does have uh, female members. So for example, in France, uh, there are, are lodges there that recognize women as uh, uh, Orthodox female members, as Orthodox members. Freemasonry began in Western Europe, emerging from the medieval guilds of stonemasons. At the turn of the 18th century, which is right around when Anderson's Constitutions was published, uh, the rites and rituals of actual Masons became the basis of study. It was the 18th century expansion of print culture, uh, increasingly empirical approaches to examining and understanding nature, and new kinds of civic and social associations that promoted interest in the history, training, and knowledge of actual stonemasons. Their origin stories and their construction skill provided the symbolic, metaphorical, and functional blueprints for understanding human social worlds. Men that were not builders formed associations based upon making the knowledge of actual stonemasons theoretical and fundamental. They created societies whose rituals, excuse me, whose rituals were kept private as part of making them sacred. Membership to any particular lodge could be exclusive, but separate lodges proliferated and each lodge practiced a delicate balance between deference and democracy. Rank of officers was recognized, but initiation meant that in theory, members congregated as social and political equals. And so this is illustration is not an illustration of any kind of Masonic rite, uh, but it is an 18th century uh, depiction of this growing kind of empirical approach uh, and curiosity to the natural world. And so in the same way uh, that we can see these people who are thinking about cosmology in this particular case, orrery, we can imagine that Freemasons were interested in the signs and symbols and practices of actual stonemasons as ways to think about how the world operated. And that one of the things that they then do is to take various biblical histories 
um, and identify architects and builders in those biblical histories as people who become part of this uh, long uh, Masonic tradition. And so by the late 18th century, Freemasonry had spread throughout Europe and even touched on African shores. The quote, deputations sent beyond sea, quote, from the London Grand Lodge included permits sent to places as varied as East India, uh, the American colony of New Jersey, Paris, Hamburg, quote, Gambay in West Africa, and the quote, Leeward Caribbean. Although these lodges functioned under uh, dispensations or licenses from the London Grand Lodge, distance hampered efforts by central authorities to supervise or even observe the activities of these new groups. Um, and it's also important to think about uh, Freemasonry emerging from various centers in uh, Scotland and Ireland as well. So the spread of the craft allowed for the possibility that Africans throughout the diaspora might have encountered Masons and Masonry. From Grand Lodges located in France, Scotland, and Great Britain, Freemasonry extended to the Caribbean and the Americas, to South Asia, to North, South, East Africa, and to West Africa. And so African Lodge number one was the first lodge in Masonic history to be founded and populated solely by men of African descent that explicitly understood themselves in modern racial terms. Africans and their immediate descendants entered lodges throughout the Atlantic world, and it is possible that some lodges may have consisted mostly of African descended members. Historian Han Schwartz in recent work noted that in what is today the Republic of Nicaragua on its Eastern coast, historically occupied by the Miskew people, uh, there was a Eureka Lodge, number 673, and it might have included se several members of African descent. In mid 18th century France, government authorities suspecting Freemasons as potential subversives raided various Masonic meetings where they found black participants. After the establishment of the African Lodge in Boston, some of its later members like Nero Prince and Prince Saunders would travel to Russia and Haiti respectively. Tantalizing questions remain about a Black Atlantic world shaped in part by relationships between Black Freemasons residing in different nations. Although there is no direct link between African social and political forms in the 18th century emergence of African American Freemasonry, the question merits some discussion. The number of enslaved African arrivals to Boston and New England generally was far less than other major ports of disembarkation in the Caribbean and the Americas. However, that slavery integrated all English colonial expansion meant that New England did receive African natives. Although the surges of owned human imports into Boston mostly came from the Caribbean, many could still have been native to Africa. In fact, Phyllis Wheatley is the most known of native African arrivals. And despite her conversion to Protestant Christianity, her journey highlights the significance of African origins. The Massachusetts Sentinel, of August 19, 1786, read a description of the funeral for Luke Belcher, a member of African Lodge, that described Belcher as, quote, by, by birth an African. It is more than mere speculation that individual Africans could bring with them particular knowledge and presence to affect identity, community, and politics among enslaved groups in the New World, especially, and in this case, Massachusetts. And so the enslaved in New England did leave a remarkable, even if fragmented, public record, demonstrating that African cultural forms could have persisted in complex yet noticeable ways, giving added context to the emergence of Black Freemasonry. Historians of colonial New England have highlighted the mid-century development of public celebrations of Election Day in New England and Pinkster in the mid-Atlantic colonies. And now these were celebrations of uh, people, many of whom were enslaved, where they gathered together and essentially celebrated in ceremonies that were described by white observers. And certainly we, we our kind of archival record of these election days is lacking, but nonetheless, we can read between the lines of white observers 
and know that white observers were struck by how the celebrations seemed to consist of various kinds of rituals and music and movements uh, that had been native to Africa. In Massachusetts and Boston more specifically, these public black led events began to appear after a wave of importation into New England uh, beginning in the 1730s. And despite little surviving biographical evidence for the first black American Freemasons, they were a generation uh, that included native born Americans, uh, Africans and the descendants of both. In terms of ritual, it's intriguing that election days and Masonic funerals were both public events that drew <laughs> large crowds, including those of African descent, and that existed across the same generation. And so the Reverend William Bentley from Salem, Massachusetts, uh, who actually knew Prince Hall personally, commented, albeit patronizingly, about one of his enslaved girls, that at election time, she would participate, quote, in the most fatiguing dances, quote, as she listened to, quote, the never ceasing sound of the violin. So there's no record of Black Masons in any of Boston's lodges before the founding of the African Lodge. And Freemasonry first arrived in colonial North America in the 1730s with the formation of St. John Lodge in Philadelphia. Different Masonic governing bodies in Europe, in Europe bestowed competing charters to different groups in the colonies. The relationship between colonial masonry and race reflected the broad social acceptance of racial slavery by colonial masons and the genteel and elite culture of pre-revolutionary masonry. Historian Stephen Bullock explained that colonial American masons, predominantly men of rank, emphasized the tenets of love and honor to buttress solidarity among the genteel, educated, and wealthy. They, they emphasized equality amongst themselves to reinforce their identities as distinguished gentlemen. Stephen Bullock also shows how American Freemasonry uh, expands and transforms itself during and after the American Revolution. During the conflict, military lodges provided fertile ground for growing its membership. Masonry became appealing to non-elite men who aspired to prominence in a newly forming nation. A group of Masons who called themselves ancients named the previous generation of fraternal elites moderns. The ancients, comprising many younger men who had become the leaders of the American Revolution, invented a claim to an older and hence supposedly more legitimate heritage than that of the moderns. Joseph Warren in St. Andrew's Lodge self-identified as ancients, and John Rowe's first lodge became seen as moderns. By the 1790s, ancient Freemasons had overtaken their older counterparts in membership and influence. The colonial ancients also gained vital support in their, formal, in their formative stages from a similar split occurring in Great Britain during the mid 18th century. And so on the screen, uh, I have a portrait of Tyan, Tyan, Tyan uh, bleh, forgive me, Tyan Danego or Joseph Brandt. Tyan Danego was a Mohawk who became initiated into a white lodge, Hiram's Cliftonian Lodge number 417 in London in 1776. As a youth, Tyan Danego attended the Moores Indian Charity School in Lebanon, Connecticut, which would later on become Dartmouth. Uh, and he became an Anglican and adopted the interests of Great Britain while also representing his identity as a Mohawk and member of the intertribal alliance, the Iroquois Confederacy. Hannah Matha Crocker of Boston began her own lodge for women, St. Anne's. Several of Crocker's female acquaintances had married Freemasons and her interest with the lodge led her to investigate their, these women's concerns with their, their, their husbands kind of going away in secret. Uh, and so she investigates the fraternity and its history on her own. Her curiosity reflected an upbringing in the Mather family. Her grandfather was the famous Cotton Mather and her father was the important Samuel Mather. Not only did Hannah form 
uh, her own lodge. But she also published an important and often overlooked piece of political theory, observations on the real rights of women with their appropriate duties agreeable to scripture, reason, and common sense. Although Crocker's masonry was not recognized by other lodges, she, like Hall, demonstrated a serious commitment to comprehending Masonic history relative to her identity and the events of the American Revolution. So not only did Black Freemasonry exemplify a significant expansion of Freemasonry, it reflected the growth of voluntary associations in New England. So in only a half decade from 1770 to 1820, the number of charitable organizations in New England rose from 50 to over 1,500. A list of these new organizations, although hardly comprehensive, would include anti-slavery societies, missionary societies, benevolent associations, poor relief societies, temperance societies, and Masonic lodges. As part of this growth, free Black populations in the northern seaports of Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Newport, and Providence set about forming their own mutual benefit societies, churches, schools, and fraternal orders. And so what were the circumstances of this cohort that would organize the first Black Lodge? Despite disagreement about the exact date of the African Lodge's founding, Masonic and academic historians agree that Hall and his peers entered the craft during the late 1770s. Two key documents frame the earliest appearance of Black Freemasons. A list of the first Black initiates dated March 6th, uh, with, with the year partially smudged out. Uh, and another role clearly dated March 6, 1778. So two documents dated March 6, one document with the year not easily or even easily read or even really legible, uh, and the second document also dated March 6, 1778. That 1778 document is what I have on the screen for you now. And this document comes from uh, the microfilm of the records of the Prince Hall Grand, Grand Lodge. I have not seen that, the physical book, but I've seen the microfilm of that book uh, that's kept uh, by the Prince Hall Lodge in Boston and also uh, the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts. And so if you look closely, you'll see around, within the two circles that I have there on the screen, one of them uh, denotes Prince Hall. And even though it's hard to discern, um, to, to the right of his name is our, kind of an abbreviation for Grand Master. And then towards the middle of the screen, on the bottom, you see Peter Betts or Besties. And he's the gentleman that I've already talked about uh, who helped author that 1773 petition and along with Hall that 1777 uh, petition. Both of these March 6 documents include the name of John Batt and John Batt's name is not on the document that I have on the screen because I cut the document to blow up these names but he's on the bottom of the rest of this document. John Batt was a Mason and presumably white Although Prince Hall Freemasons today and their past historians have argued that the doc, that one of the March 6 documents was in fact dated 1775, uh, there has been debate amongst Freemasons themselves uh, about um, the veracity of that particular date. Um, and so even though this particular document has 1778 as readable, um, it's still not clear, or I should say neither of these documents reveal particular detail about the ritual or exact location of initiation. Um, but when compared with other bits of evidence, um, they add to, excuse me, a complicated puzzle. <clears throat> 
Both March 6 documents illustrate that 15, at least 15 men um, became uh, Freemasons. And the documents also detail uh, the cost that's associated with the attainment of various degrees. And so within Freemasonry, there are three kind of basic levels, uh, craft, apprentice, and master. The 1778 document also indicates that at this point in time, different members had different degrees. So Prince Hall and his peers had to pay as part of their initiation. If these men paid different amounts to receive different degrees, or, or one or more of them might have, it, this suggests that one or more of them might have already been Freemasons uh, at a particular level, um, which would then have allowed them to pay and then perform the ritual and attain a different level. The pricing of degrees on these documents might also be read simply as a cost listing. This view would imply that all 15 individuals entered into Freemasonry at the same time, even if some of them had more knowledge or uh, about the fraternity or more money. In either case, charity, regalia, ritual, and literature all played central roles in the expense of Masonic uh, membership. One had to pay for various uh, uh, artifacts, relics that were important uh, for these aspects of Masonic membership. And Stephen Bullock uh, notes that it was not until the 19th century that Masonry in America viewed normative regulation as central. And so uh, that early Black members gave money as part of their entrance or advancement into Freemasonry uh, should only be seen as part of uh, a regular landscape of ritual practice where, in fact, variation uh, was was normal. Now, despite the difficulties of of kind of finding prosopographical prosopog <laughs> I can't talk um, biographical information uh, about uh, these black members, one of the founding members uh, does stand out. Um, and so uh, a bit of kind of post apography of Prince Hall helps us understand a bit about his social networks and to some degree his political outlook. And so here I have a picture of a taking book from Boston. These were used to collect taxes. These are basically Boston tax records. And so not only do they partially illuminate Prince Hall's social worlds, they also reveal the competing significance of locality and mobility in shaping his political and fraternal outlooks. A careful compilation of these tax records from 1780 to uh, 1801 reveals approximately 1184 different individuals identified as persons of color, uh, and they're described as black, Negro, or mulatto. And so in those approximate 20 years, assessors identified the Masonic Hall for 15 years. And this in fact was the most of any black person in the period. Uh, and authorities uh, denoted him as uh, a leather dresser, as quote, Freemason, as quote, worshipful grand master, as quote, master Mason, and as quote, black Freemason and master of Lodge. These tax records demonstrate that Black people uh, and people in general were constantly on the move within the small port city of Boston. Black mobility shaped Hall's politics and his relationship to Freemasonry. We have no evidence that Hall arrived to Boston from another place or that he left Boston once rooted there. However, that Hall would gain initiation into fraternity with international reputation and reach, that he considered the feasibility of leaving North America in 1787, and that his reputation attracted the Black preacher John Morant demonstrated his astute worldliness. And so what you see in front of you is a page from a taking book. And what I have circled, uh, you see there James Lower 
and then you see the abbreviation for black and then moving to the right uh, page, you see that he's servant to uh, Ditto, which would be uh, Thomas Paine just uh, above him. From a different uh, page, you see here William Pierre noted as black and then Boston Ballard just below him. Uh, and there's that abbreviation Ditto, uh, also black. Uh, and you also see that there are notes about uh, their, their living accommodation. So they each live in a room. These taking books were also organized by ward. So you get a general sense of the parts of the city in which uh, the people noted here lived. In the 1790s, the esteemed white Reverend Jeremy Belknap uh, acknowledged Hall's authority and asked his thoughts regarding emancipation in Massachusetts. Belknap quoted Hall, who apparently explained that, quote, harmony in a great measure prevails between us as citizens, for the good law of the land does oblige everyone to live peaceably with all his fellow citizens, let them be black or white. For we stand on a level, a Masonic metaphor, uh, therefore no preeminence can be claimed on either side, quote. However, we should take uh, Hall's words here with a grain of salt and consider uh, issues of audience. Because in 1797, in a printed address to the African Lodge, Hall highlighted the experiences of everyday racism in Boston. And again, I want to point out that this is in 1797. So the Revolutionary War, uh, you know, it ends in the early 1780s. And so we're in a period where, you know, we have the new nation moving forward in its development. And yet even in an abolitionist state like Massachusetts, uh, we hear the following from Hall. He counseled his audience to have fortitude, stating, quote, patience, I say, for were we not possessed of a great measure of it, you could not bear up under the daily insults you meet with in the streets of Boston. Graphically describing this violence, Hall further bemoaned that, quote, helpless old women have their clothes torn off their backs, even to the exposing of their nakedness, quote. Hall attributed this brutality not, quote, to the men born and bred in Boston, for they are better bred, but by a mob or a horde of shameless, low-lived, envious, spiteful persons, some of them not long since servants in gentlemen's kitchens. So here, Hall's reversal of racist tropes reflected that the contradictions of emancipation during the revolutionary era had only wound themselves more deeply into the social fabric of a place like Massachusetts. Although his critique blamed whites of lower status, instead of locating racism within broader legal or social structures, it also deployed ideas of respectability against certain white people while elevating the civic virtue of black residents. Challenges of race and questions of Masonic le legitimacy shaped the formation of the African Lodge. The question of authenticity became increasingly important after the Revolutionary War, when the generation of post-war Masons reacted to Masonry's significant ex expansion with a new concern for the centralized bureaucratic authorization of new lodges. And so, for example, in 1763, when a group of white Bostonians approached the Lodge of St. Lodge of St. Andrews, an ancient assembly, the members scorned the petition, saying that the applicants were, quote, very improper persons, quote, who, quote, will inevitably bring the craft into the greatest disgrace imaginable. The reception of white Masons to the Black group was mixed. One unsubstantiated narrative argues that Hall first applied to General Joseph Warren for a charter to establish an all-Black lodge. By 1775, Warren was the Grand Master of the ancient Grand Lodge of Massachusetts. This story further proposes that either these ancient Masons refused Hall outright, or that the appeal of Hall to Warren, a man agreeable to the notion of Black Freemasonry, ended with Warren's death at the Battle of Bunker Hill. Although American Masons did not grant 
Hall the authority to initiate new members, they did recognize him and his cohort as Masons. And so prior to receiving a formal charter from the Grand Lodge of England in 1787, Hall maintained a correspondence with them that began at least as early as 1779. And so during the 1780s, the membership of African Lodge increased. However, it's still not exactly clear how this happened. So in June 1784, Hall wrote to the Grand Lodge of England in London to ask for uh, a warrant or an official charter. Uh, and, and he wrote, quote, or he wrote that the African Lodge had been founded, and so again, this is in 1784. He wrote the African Lodge had been founded, quote, almost eight years ago, and that they had had no warrant yet, but only a permit from Grand Master Rowe to walk on St. John's days and to bury our dead in form. So this row was John Rowe, the provincial Grand Master of North America that recognized Hall's cohort as African Lodge number one. And so this provisional uh, license uh, allowed African Lodge to meet, but it didn't necessarily allow the lodge to initiate new members. And it's also interesting that uh, going back to 1779 in Hall's correspondence to London, he sent them the quote, general regulations of African Lodge, which consisted of seven rules of conduct applicable to all members. And included in this correspondence, Hall named 18 masters, 11 apprentices, and four crafts. Uh, the records of the African Lodge show continual uh, kind of development of membership from the 1770s into uh, the 1780s. And so by the 1780s, abolition had gained significant momentum in Massachusetts, but its results were uncertain, if not contradictory. For Hall, the ambiguities of freedom demanded a pragmatic politics. So on November 26, 1786, 1786, Hall wrote to the governor of Massachusetts, James Bowden, and pledged the support of the Black Masons to any state-supported efforts against Shays' Rebellion, an insurrection of poor farmers in Western Massachusetts led by Daniel Shays, a veteran soldier who had fought at the Battle of Bunker Hill. Just the next year, in 1787, Hall and approximately 72 others applied, applied to the Massachusetts General Court with a plan to emigrate to Africa. Again, in the same year, later on in the same year, Hall and 34 male signers wrote to the Boston selectmen asking for support uh, for uh, Black education. And so this is an excerpt uh, from that letter. And you can begin to see some of the people who have signed uh, on the bottom to the left, you see the signature of Prince Hall. And then on the second page, you see other people who signed. And this document is really interesting because some of the signatures are represented by an X. And so amongst the Freemasons, clearly Prince Hall was literate. There were other members who apparently were not literate, but yet who probably through the efforts of literate members were able to learn uh, the ritual. The next year, in 1788, Hall success successfully complains in New England newspapers about the kidnapping of three Black men, one of them, in fact, being a member of the African Lodge. And uh, Hall, through the efforts of Hall in coordination uh, with Qu Quakers and Massachusetts leaders, was actually able to get those men back. And so with Hull's successful uh, campaign in 1788 to, to bring these kidnapped men back, I kind of want to stop uh, uh, the discussion um, 
where I'm making the argument for the historical importance of Freemasonry um, by locating it within the era of emancipation and the early Republic. And I wanna kind of switch gears a little bit as I move towards an end. And so despite the obvious prominence of men in this narrative of Freemasonry's development, briefly examining its broader communal context reveals a glimpse of the roles that women played relative to the incorporation of Masonic identity. We find the roles of black women in an unlikely place, an Anglican church. And so in fact, the old North church um, comes out of Christ's church, which used to be, which was uh, an Anglican church. For two main reasons, the significance of Masonic wives has been overlooked. Much of the literature examining the religious lives of the enslaved before the emergence of black churches has tended to emphasize the deprivation and prescription of black spiritual belief and practice. There's a lot of fantastic work that talks about African and African-American spirituality um, in the context of uh, slavery. But nonetheless, particularly when we're thinking about Northern African-American uh, communities, uh, you know, there's a particular draw to institutions like the African Methodist Episcopal Church, and people tend to think about Black religion relative to the establishment of formal uh, Black churches. However, oh, and, and in addition to that, when we're thinking about New England in particular, uh, the prominence of congregationalism uh, has led scholars away from thinking about forms of Black religion. Uh, that happened outside of uh, New England Puritanism. And so here the records of the Old North and other previously Anglican churches uh, in Boston become important. And so between 1782 and 1802, Prince Hall attended five different baptisms at Trinity Church in Boston. On, uh, in August of 1782, Bess Hubbard and Prince Hall and his wife stood as godparents during the baptism of Susanna Bess Means, the daughter of Eunice and John Means, a member of the African, and John Means was a member of the African Lodge. In July of 1788, Hall, along with Dinah and, uh, and Jack Harrison, were sponsors for the baptism of Henry Stevenson and Rufus Callahan. Neither man was a Freemason, however, both occupied important positions. Stevenson worked as only one of two black sextons, effectively grave diggers at the turn of the century. And Callahan began membership in the African Society of Boston, excuse me, begun in 1796. In November, 1788, Hall and, Diana, and Diane Belcher witnessed the baptism of John Dennis, uh, quote, an adult Negro. On, in, in June, 1791, Hall, Hannah and Thomas Burdine and Mrs. Watts attended the baptism of Elizabeth Hunter and Joseph Hicks, a black Freemason. Burdine joined the African Society in 1796 and the husband of Mrs. Watts, Prince, found in the 1798 Massachusetts and Maine direct tax was one of the few property owning black Bostonians in the early 19th century. Moreover, Diana Belcher was the wife of Luke Belcher who I've previously mentioned. In May of 1802, Hall and Phoebe Hawkins observed the baptism of Sophia Matilda Woten, the daughter of Robert and Catherine. Phoebe married James Hawkins on June 15, 1794. Before James' death in the next two years, he joined both the African Society and the Black Masonic Lodge. These baptismal ceremonies all occurred at the Anglican Trinity Church. Black baptisms in Boston's Church of England parishes were comparable over the course of the 18th century. And so prior to 1776, King's Chapel, Christ Church or Old North, or later Old North and Trinity Church baptized 57, 95 and 61 people of African descent respectively. And so I've already talked briefly about Luke Belcher uh, an obituary in the American Recorder described Luke as a, quote, late governor of Africans, and there was a public ceremony uh, for his death that was participated in and organized by African Lodge. 
While Belcher was lauded widely, his wife, Diana, went about cohering community privately through the sponsorship and witnessing of baptisms. The two married at Trinity in 1765, and at the time of their union, they both worked as servants, Luke for Madame Louise uh, Belcher and Diana for Phoebe Borland. Luke and Diana stood together as either godparents or witnesses for the christening of African-American adults and children three times from 1780 to 1781. Diana with others, but not including Luke, became godparent or served as witness an additional four times between 1783 and 1790. In 1783, Diana and William Gregory sponsored the baptism of Hannah Glapion, the daughter of Louis Glapion and his wife, Phoebe Gould. Three years later, Diana Belcher, a Mrs. Newell and Louis Glapion became godparents at the baptism of Rebecca Francis Foster Gregory, the daughter of Anne and William Henry Gregory. Gregory became a member of the African Lodge in 1778 and paid dues for a Masonic burial in the, in the 1780s. In 1788, Diana and Prince Hall witnessed the baptism of John Dennis, and two years later, Diana and Thomas Burdeen witnessed the baptism of the adult servant, Chloe. So like Prince Hall and Diana Belcher, Hannah and Thomas Burdeen also involved themselves in the ritual lives of Blacks at Trinity, and there's a record of them um, serving as witnesses um, or sponsors at um, various uh, baptisms. That all these baptisms revolved around the conversion of African Americans reflected a small yet animated community cohered through religious ritual and Black institutional membership. In a deeply gendered and patriarchal society, women like Diana Belcher and Hannah Burdeen took advantage of spiritual kinship to create and reinforce non-nuclear family relationships between African-Americans. And so in conclusion, during the American Revolution and at the turn of the 19th century, Black Freemasons organized political campaigns and carved out their own spaces of religious practice. Uh, however, these Masons did so as participants within interracial worlds of politics and religion. The history of African American Freemasonry is inextricable from broader narratives. Exploring these relationships not only enriches our understanding of contradictions and contingencies during the revolutionary era, it demonstrates that people of African descent have always been pivotal actors in American politics and civil life. And so just to return to this kind of uh, beginning uh, PowerPoint, uh, you have beginning in the lower left, uh, uh, an illustration of the Boston Massacre, uh, which involved Christmas Attucks, who was of you know, Black and Indigenous parentage. Uh, the document that looks kind of indecipherable is in fact a document of the initiation of the, the Prince Hall and 14 other men. Here we have uh, in fact uh, Prince Hall's tombstone, uh, which still stands today. And here we have a newspaper article that mentions uh, not only Prince Hall, but his son. And here uh, is a, a famous emblem uh, that was used during emancipation. And then to the far right of the screen, uh, we have this, an, this appeal that was printed and published by David Walker, who was also uh, a Freemason. And so even though my remarks today essentially kind of end at the turn of the 19th century, um, it's fascinating to think about the ways in which African-American Freemasonry develops um, and shapes various political contexts as one moves into the 19th century. One of those political contexts, in fact, being the shift from gradual emancipation to immediate or radical emancipation. And David Walker, who was a member of African Lodge, was instrumental uh, in accelerating 
uh, abolitionism in the 19th century. And so uh, with that, I wanna thank all of you uh, for your time and uh, your attention. So I will stop there. Well, thank you so much, Cherno. That was so interesting. And um, I would like to invite people if they have questions or comments to please put them in the chat. I was struck by the fact that um, that the structure of Freemasonry and the shared um, ritual would act as a unifying force for people who had disparate life experiences and backgrounds themselves, and, and also would potentially provide a bridge to other lodges with, with very different, like this, this shared vocabulary and um, philosophical framework acted to unite people who might otherwise not have found one another. Catherine, that's a great point. And if I can elaborate on that just a little bit, you know, there, there is a, a, a literature on Freemasonry coming out of sociology that tends to examine Freemasonry relative to issues of class. But, but I think your comments, Catherine, are really important because they emphasize the way in which Freemasonry becomes both an institution and a set of ideas that can in fact bring people from disparate social backgrounds together, not only for political organizing, but also for various other kinds of kind of communal um, uh, recognition, affirmation, and formation. And so the, the emphasis there um, is, is less on Freemasonry as a kind of elite institution amongst people of African descent, Although I would argue that it is in some ways, it does serve that purpose. But really, when you're thinking about the development of the new nation and the fact that most people of African descent have very few resources, and even those that have some resources, um, th their resources are always precarious. Um, Freemasonry, not only does it give a kind of institutional and political identity to people who join or people who are somehow connected to it, but, and I didn't talk about this in the talk, when we begin to examine the literature that Prince Hall uh, uh, publishes in the 1790s, in many ways, he's responding to these histories of Freemasonry, and he's arguing uh, for the importance of African history within these histories of Freemasonry. So not only are we getting the creation of, of actual you know, kind of institutional physical groups, we're also getting the creation of literature that helps people imagine themselves um, as, as, as a linked uh, group, a linked uh, cohort, um, uh, a cultural uh, group, if you will. Yeah, um, we have a few questions coming up. Um, one is, when does the African Lodge become able to own or even rent its own space? In the 1820s, there were, they were tenants of Thomas Paul at the African Meeting House. Is there any evidence for earlier? There is. There, there, they, the, the Lodge records uh, suggest that, that they moved uh, the Lodge meeting place to different places, um, some of those places being in people's homes, some of those places uh, possibly being in um, uh, Boston, Boston taverns. Now that certainly would raise questions because a lodge room needs to be organized in a particular way. Um, but prior to that establishment uh, that I think David Weber makes mention, um, they are organizing um, in it wherever they can kind of find, uh, find space. Um, thank you. Uh, Jamie's firstly thanking you for this wonderful talk. Uh, her questions are, first, what do you think appealed about Freemasonry to the men who founded the African Lodge, the first African Lodge? And second, what role do godparents play to baptized children? Mm. 
Those are fantastic questions. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Crumley. So in some ways, the appeal of Freemasonry to men of African descent was the same for, for white men. Uh, you have this organization that was certainly known about. It was talked about, it's, it's, it's discussed in, in colonial newspapers. So even though it's, it's, it's rituals are held in secret, uh, people know about, about this group. And so, you know, Stephen Book does a wonderful job of talking about the expansion of Freemasonry amongst kind of all these diff different demographic groups during and after the, the revolution. And so somebody for somebody like uh, Paul Revere, uh, Freemasonry provides a vehicle to establish themselves in this newly developing nation. I think that also applied to people of African descent. At the same time, I also think that because Freemasonry was associated with sacred knowledge and because it appealed to a lot of different people across different de demographies for that in the same way that there are various instances of, uh, and in fact, this tradition of African-Americans wanting to be able to read the Bible and African-Americans gaining literacy by being able to read the Bible. I do think there was a kind of cosmological intellectual appeal of Freemasonry, that this would be a source of, of, of private knowledge that, that could be shared amongst the members, but that also could be kind of, that could become a focal point within uh, the community. So I think uh, in short, this idea of there being a sacred knowledge, I think was really important. And then all the more, uh, Prince Hall essentially is responding to these prior histories of Freemasonry that either leave Africa out or that illustrate Africa as playing a kind of less than progressive role in this, in this you know, ever progressing history of the world. And Prince Hall wants to respond against that. And so one can imagine that in identifying the role of Africa and of Africans um, as you know, ancient builders, uh, he's creating a kind of imaginary template uh, to uh, affirm and inspire other people of African descent, even if they're not members of the lodge. And to your question about uh, God parentage, um, that's I think God parentage serves all sorts of interesting uh, uh, mechanisms. So certainly on the one hand, you know, when we're thinking about all of these groups and people in the archives who don't immediately appear, uh, sponsorship and, and witnessing, I argue, allows these women to establish themselves as kind of pivotal figure, figures in the particular creation of these kinds of communities. And, and by locating an individual within a white church, um, but a black ceremony within a white church, there are many different ways in which not only is that ceremony bestowing a kind of you know, spiritual affirmation upon the adult or the baby, but it's also linking that individual into a broader religious slash social network um, that can help establish that person when we're thinking about questions of settlement or we're thinking about questions of uh, support. I wonder too, if there's an element of um, reputation that to be associated, um, to be a member of this lodge, to be a God, to have as your godparent, someone with a known reputation is also a way of, of kind of casting a protective um, net over people who are, are just beginning to build their own reputations. I, I think that's right. And really that's that's the argument that I emphasize. There mm -hmm. have been interpretations that have looked at the idea of, of, of respectability as in some ways as a kind of negative strategy, uh, negative political strategy. In other words, uh, they see uh, the issue of, of somebody's respectability 
as an attempt for people of African descent to want to fit into um, these emerging uh, local uh, state and national structures. But I think what's happening is that the American Revolution is allowing Black people to reframe their own identities as free people. And so I think there is an internal process of community building and of affirmation um, and of network building uh, that, is, that is going on. So we can't so easily um, dismiss something like God parentage as, as somehow a facile attempt um, to, be, to be accepted by the broader society. Um, mindful of the time. Can you suggest any good books about Prince Hall for further reading? And you mentioned microfilm from the Prince Hall Masons. Where can someone go to research their own family history in Freemasonry? That's a great question. You know, I think, so the, sorry, the first question, oh, books on Freemasonry. Well, so <laughs> it's taken me a little while, uh, but I'm, I'm writing one. So when I'm done with it, I will certainly let you know. But, but, you know, Charles Wesley is, uh, wrote, um, it's an older book now, and he himself was a Masonic historian. And, you know, that, that's an excellent start to, to as an introduction uh, to, to think about uh, Freemasonry. Um, the Phylaxis, which is the scholarly arm of African-American Freemasonry, if you look up their website, uh, they are really, I think, a clearinghouse for really great literature and uh, some recent work. Uh, there is, oh my gosh, I'm for, there's a book. Uh, I'm going to turn around to see if it's right behind me. And it's not right behind me. Um, but, but in terms of a follow-up, there's a recent book written by a young African-American uh, Mason about the westward expansion of uh, Freemasonry. It's a great read and it's really revealing. Um, not only does it talk about Freemasonry, but it makes the basic argument that, you know, black people were a part of West, Western expansion as well. Um, I can share that going forward, but off the top of my head, I'm actually forgetting the author and uh, the, the title. Someone in the chat just said um, James Morgan. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, James Morgan. Um, uh, right, worshipful Kevin Waterley. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. So ordinarily, I send out a follow-up email to all of the people who signed up for the talk. So maybe we could, um, if you would be so kind as to give me some of these book suggestions, I'll include that in my follow-up to everybody. Oh, certainly, certainly. Oh, great. Um, I think we have time for maybe one more question and this is tough um the image of the black man on his knees with hands cuffed where does that come from and is it supposed to be associated with black freedom and if so why not have him standing up with broken cuffs mm -hmm. that's a great question so that image comes from the 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 kind of mid to late 18th century uh it's it's attributed to uh josiah wedgwood but it becomes popular and it gets printed all over the place. And you know, the, uh, the critique that this participant offers of the, of the document is, is certainly, I think, an insightful one. The document does, I think, demonstrate, it demonstrates several things. It certainly demonstrates this very strong current of paternalism that existed amongst white abolitionists, people that were absolutely dedicated to ending slavery, but who also thought that the leadership of organized abolition had to be white. It couldn't be black. And so out of, out of that approach to anti-slavery politics and abolitionist campaigning, we get images like this that um, are on the one hand critical, as, as the participant points out, critical of slavery, but, but also um, problematic in the way they demonstrate the enslaved as being kind of deferential 
and mm -hmm. subservient. Certainly within the petitions, we see a transition um, as Black people are really trying to gauge uh, the conflict that's arising um, between patriots and British forces. And you, when we think about politics in Boston during the revolutionary era, you know, so 1773, when the petition is written, you know, you have various members of the Massachusetts General Court who are becoming increasingly intolerant of, of British rule, but the governor, Thomas Hutchinson, you know, he's all about British rule. So when we think about the complexity of politics during the revolutionary era, black people are trying to navigate that in their own interests. And part of what they're having to navigate is in fact, as a participant points out, this idea of, of, of kind of white benevolent paternalism. Right. Well, I want to thank you again, and there are there are so many expressions of gratitude and and enjoyment in the chat. So um, this has been wonderful, and it's really just I think scratches the surface of exploring the different institutions and um, and places where the Black community found its voice and support. So thank you very very much. Um, and thank you all for being with us tonight and for um, your great questions and comments. We really, really appreciate it. Yeah, this was great. Um, Old North Illuminated, thank you so much again for having me. Always going to be a pleasure. All right. Take care, everybody. Have a good night. <laughs>